Just before we begin this video, I'd like to let people know that by becoming a patron or donating £5 or more, you'll be given special access to my unreleased review on Western anime theme songs. Links in the description below. Hello everybody, my name is Nick Starwood and welcome to the finale of our special, where in celebration of the one year anniversary of The Missing Coach Part 3, I have decided to spend every week of this month, although we're now in February so it doesn't count, looking at the plethora of Thomas the Tank Engine games. In our series so far, we have looked into the early days of Amiga and DOS games, jumped onto the Nintendo and Sega bandwagon to see what they brought the table, before returning to the PC to have a look at Hasbro and Infogram's contributions to the CD-ROM interactive world. Remember to check out the previous episodes of our special in the links below or on my channel, and remember to like, share, and subscribe to keep yourself up to date. Also, don't forget that for the games we cover each week, we'll be playing over on Twitch every Thursday at twitch.tv slash streams to give you a better look into the variety of games we'll be covering, with the previous ones also saved on there. So, with that being said, we have quite a lot of games to look over in this video, ranging from the contemporary western releases, to our return to the land of the rising sun with some mod Japanese games, with a few oddities thrown in between. So, let's dive in. So, while the Western world was trying to find what makes a good Thomas game, creating it, and then never returning to it in favour of garbage, Japan was having a whale of a time developing a variety of games, some of course being for educational purposes, and others that were thinking much further ahead than whatever we could come up with at the time. Introducing the Sega Pico and the Advanced Pico Bina, video game consoles designed for education purposes, cringingly called edutainment, with the Pico releasing in Japan, America and Europe in 1993, but sadly not gaining much interest outside of Japan, being discontinued in 1998. Probably, because judging by the Wikipedia, there was barely any gains for it, while in Japan it had continued success until 2005 with the release of the advanced Pico Bina, which had... <gasps> Takano Tatsujin, oh my god, what, where were those games for us? Oh. Composure, we're here to talk about Thomas games. You can talk about that later. Anyway, between this period, several Thomas the Tank Engine games were released for these systems, and if we have learnt anything from Japan, yes, they were exclusive only to Japan, because clearly we were fine with games like Richard Scary's Huckle and Lowly's Busiest Day Ever, while putting up with... that game. All the while the Japanese were treated to good quality games. The first game was Kakansha Thomas de Note in 1995, which sees you travelling around the island, meeting different characters, and doing various minigames throughout. Which, when looking at it, does share some similarities to the Super Nintendo game, but this one actually respects the idea that your children have taste. Travelling around the island is displayed with these cute 2D sprites as you pass characters, collect coaches, stop at stations, and partake in a few minigames on offer, as, despite its colourful presentation, it is still being powered by the same system as the Genesis with early tablet technology, so sacrifices had to be made, but it doesn't ruin the overall experience. You have games involving judging the stopping distance at a station, guessing the path to collect Annie and Clarable, and these top-down sections where you place track to avoid other characters or build a path to the station, which is similar in many ways to what we saw in the Adventure series on Super Nintendo, but this is a more evolved version as you are in more control of what you can do, whether it's just roaming the island in a loop or rushing through the game as quick as you can. It's your choice of enjoyment. A year later, its sequel, Isho ni Hashiro Kakansha Tomasu, was released, which included the addition of the narrow gauge engines and games centered around them, with the new addition of a front view while exploring the island through its different day cycles, most likely inspiring the design of the Railway Adventures PC game, with a choice of directions to take at certain points, leading to different minigames such as Guess the Engine and Racing segments adding to the previous game in a lot of different ways, but sticking to its original formula. Afterwards, it wouldn't be until 2000 before we saw a third entry into the series with U10 Thomas Deluxe Set, which was used to promote the Bandai Thomas the Tank Engine Collection series, otherwise known as the We Put More Effort Into Making Our Toys Than You, You Lazy Sod series. Because honestly, when you look at Ertl and then look at this, you know something went wrong. 
U10 Thomas Deluxe Set is a brilliant game, as it takes the things that were popular about the first two games, clean them up, add even more into the game, and package it together with this fancy controller attachment, beating Railway Adventures by one year. Which, in my opinion, if this game hadn't have been released, we wouldn't have got Railway Adventures. So thank you, Circle of Influence. The amount of stuff that has been added to this game is really impressive considering the first two were quite limited. Not only do you get the same point of view shot travelling around the island, but the load times are faster, there are more paths to take, new locations, and even mini games that happen on the open world, such as catching falling cargo, waiting for cows to get off the line, and you can even use Terrence to clear blockages off the tracks. New minigames involve battles with other engines in Balloon Netball, and even segments of chase in a top-down view, and also, you will like this, so you better check this out, it's even got a train set simulator where you freely build a layout and let the trains run in it. Take that, building a new line and your bare minimum contribution. Now, yes, the fourth and final game in the series, a lot of games Thomas and Friends in 2005 on the Advanced Peak of Bina, was admittedly a step backwards, as despite glossy new sprites, it is similar to the 1995 and 1996 games with its 2D side view and limited games, but it is still a lot better than what we had, and some of the mini games are very good quality, such as the Jack in the Pack game, and even the outrun esque race between Elizabeth and Bertie in the snow, still being a very challenging challenging but enjoyable game. But this isn't where Japan would stop. There are even more Thomas games floating around at the time, with some on the PC, and even a rarer moment, the Macintosh. Let's Hang Out Thomas was released in 1996 on the PC, Macintosh, and Bandai's Apple Pippin, and the only reason I am bringing it up is because of the shocking moment to know that excluding mobile games, this is the one and only Thomas game to be released on an Apple computer, and sadly, it really got the bad end of the stick. It's not a horrible game or anything like that, but nothing really happens with it. You travel around the island with these grainy and pixelated 3D cutscenes, going through tunnels, meeting characters, and just slowly navigating around the island, where at each station you transfer to this 2D view of these polished images and play some very basic minigames. During the 3D driving sequences, you sort of interact with your surroundings as you have a whistle and Thomas can greet... nothingness. But you don't really do much else, and when you beat a game, you get this short sequence driving next to one of the characters, but there's nothing else to it. If anything, these driving sequences feel like a loading segment for the next game, as there isn't much else to do other than what I just said. The games are nothing special, but compared to many other mini game of we've looked at, considering this was 1996, I will give it a pass because it lasts longer than 10 minutes. Anything lower than that, and I have to apologise to Nintendo, and I am not throwing in the towel yet. I wouldn't recommend this, and despite my dislike for Apple, I feel bad this was your first shot at a game. No one deserves that. But this isn't where our PC game stops. There was another game released two years later that would not only be an upgrade, but also prove once again that the favoritism for Japan was very obvious. 1998's Thomas and Friends Magical Adventure is a very sought after game among Thomas fans. Not just because it is a Japanese exclusive on PC, but because for those who are hunters of never before seen footage, this is a treasure trove of clips, both from the series and one specifically filmed during season 5 for the purpose of this game, including the use of live action footage from the Swanage Railway for some of the travelling sequences. I don't really know what to call this game, because its focus is more on travelling around Sodor and then going through tunnels to trigger these sequences where it recaps episodes from the series, mixing together screenshots, live action footage, and on the rare occasion the odd minigame, which confused me at first because when I saw this little Thomas travelling across the screen, it feels like a sort of loading bar, but once you get three episodes in, you realise this is more of a Thomas showcase than a game focused on, well, the games. You can choose between Thomas, Percy and Gordon to roam the island, which doesn't really change much except for the episodes played and the model cutscenes making it more of an interactive DVD experience than a game, with these colourful station scenes which really pop out with you being so crisp. I feel like I would have been totally blown away by this as a kid, considering the Great Festival Adventure wouldn't be out until a year after, which, yes, still a good game, but it isn't this. I actually feel pretty let down looking at this game. 
Now, once you have completed these sections, you can go to the Fat Controller's office and experience a large variety of mini games, each explained to you as if you're in Goldeneye with this picture in black and white and this ominous music playing, before leading you into the puzzle games, climbing challenges, and one particular one where you construct the theme song using traffic lights, and from the point of view of someone watching it rather than playing, I have no clue what is going on. But it's different, and that's what matters. Much like the Thomas in the UK trip video, this is less about the games and more about the unseen goodies, with a great visual presentation and plenty to do afterwards. If I ever had the money spare, I would definitely find a copy and add it to my collection. Now, there is one more Japanese game I would like to touch upon before we head forward in our next section, and although I believe it isn't really a Thomas game, the fact it exists is pretty interesting to me, and that we never got similar over here. In 2016, Nintendo released on the 3DS Tetsudo Nippon Rosen Tabe Kakansha Thomas Hen Oigawa Tensudo, making it not only one of the longest game titles I've ever seen, but also one of the few video games based off a heritage railway, and especially one to feature a Thomas attraction as part of its series. Tetsudo Nippon is a series of train simulator games based on different railways across Japan, with this one being based on the Oigara Railway, which has a Thomas & Friends license and its very own Thomas train based off their trains. Similar to how we had to do the same, considering the E2 is as dead as a dodo. Now, there isn't a lot out there about this game, as it seemed to have just been released and then forgotten about, leaving this video to be the only example I could find of the game. And it looks pretty cute in the intro with Thomas and the Oogawa engine running around together, before starting the game with characters such as Thomas, the Fat Controller, and Hero interacting with you throughout as you drive along the Oogawa line in this pre-recorded point of view footage, as you get badges for stopping at stations and doing basic minigames. Not much else to it, but I thought it was a pretty interesting Thomas game considering there aren't really any like this. So, if you get a hold of it and give it a go, please share it for more people to learn about it. So now that we have taken a gander at what the Japanese is clearly better at doing than us, let's slump our way back over to the west and pick up our controllers and take a gander at the few of the entries, I can't even call them goodies, that were given to us on the later generation consoles, considering the last two decent ones were Japan exclusives, with Kakensha Thomas Nakamatachi on the PS1, and Kakensha Thomas Sodo Tono Nakamatachi on the Game Boy Color, which I've already covered in the previous videos, so links below. First off, let's look at the PS2 2000 release of A Day at the Races, which incorporates one of the more unique gadgets from back in the day, the iToy, which, much like the Wii, had some gains for it, but we all know we played the release game that came with it the most. I'm not even going to talk about this one much, it's just bad. Bad, bad, and more bad. It doesn't even give the grace of using decent images for the minigames. It uses those bare bones flash designs that were being pushed so much back then while using season 6 footage, or a fraction of it, to give some story about a race before subjecting you to games using the eye toy that is about as fun as eye surgery. Just, just don't waste your time, avoid. But. Where the iToy gimmick failed to interest us, at least the Wii actually stepped up to the plate in 2010 with its movie tying game, Hero of the Rails. I'm going to have to give this one some credit, as unlike the barrel of manure we've had to put up with involving these western games, this is actually trying to make something interesting and worth your money. In Hero of the Rails, it intertwines scenes from the movie with minigames which utilises the Wii motion controllers to create, yes, a basic mini -game -thon, but it actually sells it with a decent presentation, harking back to the PC games and even some segments inspired by the Japanese ones, like getting from A to B games, whether on your own or with a different character like Spencer or Percy. Each minigame is separated with cutscenes from the movie with unique dialogue from the series narrator, similar in a way to how Toy Story 2 you'd unlock cutscenes as you progress through the game. But of course, this is in no way in that game's league. But much like many movie tying games of the past, it gets its points for doing that. There isn't really anything unique about this game considering what we've seen from Japan, but overall it's an improvement on some of the western games we've had over the years within the console generations, and if you want to give it a go, I would recommend it for your collection and there is even a Nintendo DS version which you can check out too. Now in 2015 there was another release on the Nintendo 3DS called Steaming Around Sodor, 
But there really isn't anything special to say about that except that it has a few more selections to the minigame front like bouncing balls into trucks and also a Connect 4 game using trucks. But I will give it points for its presentation as it actually uses pretty decent 3D models for the game and I can imagine many kids getting a kick out of this on long car journeys, especially with the great choice of music taken directly from the series, so definitely worth checking out if you're a CGI series fan. So in our last video we took a look at the world of PC CD-ROM games, specifically ones made by Hasbro Interactive and Infograms, and I stated after this era the quality would go downhill dramatically, and here is one particular game I was referring to. 2010 saw the release of another Thomas movie tie-in game, but this time centred around one of the fandom's most disliked movies, and that is Misty Island Rescue, and all I can say is, yeah, the movie and the game both have a lot in common. They're terrible. For a PC game that was sold in shops, this looks like a cheap flash game that you would find on an official website or Newgrounds, making Thomas Saves the Day look like The Last of Us in quality. Much like Hero of the Rails, the mini games are broken up between cutscenes from the movie, but with the added horror of these really bad flash animations that just look so cheap and not worth the effort that was supposedly put into them. Not to mention that the games themselves are just boring and not worth the time. Not much else to say, but avoid like the plague and burn any copy you find. Moving away from console and PC, I dug up some very interesting games that caught me by surprise and were actually really good considering what they were released on, making not only Japan, but the bizarre world of knockoff game toys a winner in this field of gaming. Introducing the VTech vSmile Learning System, an education console released in 2004, and much like the Sega Pico, it uses the catchy gimmick of... <sighs> Smartridges to play educational games for children, lasting up until 2010 and surprisingly selling really well considering it was competing with Sony, Microsoft and Nintendo. But I guess the parents, it's cheap and educational and doesn't have the Grand Theft Autos that are ruining society and children's minds, so they would of course have bought this instead. This is where Thomas and Friends Engines Working Together was released in 2005 in celebration of the movie Calling All Engines and the 60th anniversary of the Railway series, where you go through certain scenes of the movie while intertwining it between, you guessed it, mini games. But what is surprisingly interesting about this game, despite the console it came out on and its limitations, this is a really well presented game. There are three areas to pick from, with the most impressive being the first section called Learning Adventure, where the mini games involve you controlling Thomas, Harold or Bertie as you ride around as Thomas, doing tasks such as finding engines by spelling their names, flying over Sodor to help engines and dropping cargo into trucks as Harold, and also answering questions and dropping of passengers with Bertie. And these aren't short games either, they're quite in depth and have a lot of replay value. Then of course you get the learning zone, which involves your usual games such as counting and fixing tracks, but I do love the presentation it has all round, ending with the engine depot where you can pick engines and learn about them too, and considering some of the games we looked at on the mainstream consoles, this is a massive leap by comparison, which is great but also a shame as these would have never been seen anywhere else, which clearly, if they had appeared on more mainstream consoles, it would have been a success all round, because when the bar is on the floor, in terms of quality, you can't do any worse and this would be the same issue with our next game. As we all know, everyone hates plug and play devices unless it was released by Nintendo or you had a friend who could hack your PlayStation Mini. But out of the grade A garbage that we got like the multiple versions of Pac-Man and crotch pointing Spider-Man, guess who got another shining example of a good Thomas game? Exactly, it's Jack specific Thomas and Friends right on time plug and play game in 2006. What a sorry state of affairs we have when the VTEG and Plug and Play managed to make a better Thomas game right off the bat compared to the many, many attempts before. Right on Time is an incredibly basic game to play considering its device, but it does the one thing that shouldn't be that hard to make for a Thomas game. Exploration. When you start the game, you pick a character, get a task from the Fat Controller, and then you travel across this beast of a map, which has to come with its own mini-map in the corner, navigating your way around the island, collecting items, with the occasional mini-game thrown in, but the main game takes place on this huge map. 
Yes, it looks primitive at first glance. Yes, the character designs are incredibly creepy. But in 2006, this was the best choice you had compared to what else was around the time. And considering this game has massive Genesis adventure series vibes to it, it takes so many boxes without even trying. And the fact that the game can last up to three hours judging by the playthrough I watched, you can't exactly go wrong, can you? These two games are pretty scarce nowadays, as a lot probably found themselves in a landfill somewhere, but if you can get a hold of them, I would recommend giving them a go, especially if you are looking to try the Sega Pico as well, because they all just gel well together. Now let's move on to something I never thought I would bring up in this series, as I'm not really a fan of this type of gaming, but there are actually a fair few games for iOS and Android that have come out over the past couple of years, and surprisingly, they're actually pretty good. 2015 saw the release of Express Delivery, which was developed by Budge Studios, who made all the games I'm about to talk about on this list, where you help prepare for the Fat Controller's birthday by picking up items, digging up treasure, and building new sets and exploring the different parts of the island with the different characters that unlock them. I talk a lot about the fact that these games need more of an exploration aspect to them, so I'm very impressed that they decided to make this a feature of the game, even if I feel making a tongue-in-cheek reference to the Amiga games with how the tender engines don't have tenders, but maybe that's just a coincidence. I can see this being a very fun game to play and clearly it did very well with its target audience because in 2016 Budge released another mobile game called Magical Tracks, which is a massive upgrade compared to Express Delivery. Whereas before you just explored the basic layout of Sodor, this is definitely using Trackmaster and Take Along toy sets as the basis to its game, as it is an extremely colourful game and has a lot of toy box elements to it with how you travel around the island, collecting rolling stock, doing mini games, while unlocking these surprise packs that build the island, which, if you didn't guess, are in toy packaging. But using this element is a very clever way to get children's attention, especially as during this time you had games such as Skylanders and Disney Infinity, which were pretty expensive and even if you couldn't buy the in-game stuff, it is still a free game with some enjoyment for those looking for a budget toy box game. Two years later though, the company would move away from these building games and release Go Go Thomas in 2018, which I have actually played, so have some hands-on experience for once in this review. Taking place in everyone's favourite part of the series, Big World Big Adventure, you are given a selection of characters to choose from before racing around different courses on the island, collecting boost packs, doing stunt flips, and each race you win gives you parts of a cog that goes towards levelling up your character for better boost and acceleration. I enjoyed this game a lot and can see a lot of potential in it, especially if they took it over to a console like Nintendo Switch, giving it two Thomas games to be proud of. But the biggest letdown for me, and for all these mobile games, is the paywalls. I don't know how severe it is for the other two, as the Let's Plays I watched with this game decided to buy all the items beforehand, but in GoGo Go Thomas, it is shockingly bad, as you only unlock Thomas and one course, and you have to buy all the others, which altogether is the full game price for a console. And I believe that is really taking advantage of children looking for a decent Thomas game. If all three of these games were available for the base price with either everything unlocked or a basic progression system, I would recommend all three to you. But as someone who is against these kinds of nonsense with pay to play tactics, despite them being some of the best games out there for Thomas at the moment, I cannot recommend them to you. But I'm afraid that is it. One month and a ton of Thomas games spanning over 30 years and three different countries. But you're probably all wondering to yourself, what in my opinion is the best Thomas game out there? Which to be honest, is a very hard question to ask, so in no particular order, here are my top 5 favourites. Number 1 is the Thomas Adventure series on Sega Genesis. Number 2 is the Railway Adventures on PC. Number 3 is Kakensha Thomas to Nakamatachi on the PS1. Number 4 is U10 Thomas Deluxe on Sega Pico. And number 5 is Thomas and Friends Magical Adventure on PC. But this doesn't mean these are the last of the Thomas games to be available to us. Since the explosion of the internet, many dedicated fans have gone out of their way to either enhance their gaming experiences by building Thomas mods for games like Trains, using world creators like Roblox to build open worlds to explore, such as the really useful Engines world, and not to mention the pages and pages of Thomas Flash games that have come about over the decades that have brought fans enjoyment again and again. So there is plenty of variety out there for you to explore. 
If you would like to see more of these games, then remember to check out my Twitch channel in the links below every Thursday of this month. But until then, thank you for joining me in my journey through this history, and remember to look out for The Missing Coach Part 3.5 on my channel, rounding up this one year anniversary, despite us being in the next month. As always, to remember to like, share, subscribe, stick it on a badger, attach it to a brick, mail it to a bomb because it like a surprise, and if you can, spare some change, Governor, by donating the links below. And remember, by becoming a Patreon or donating £5 or more, you get access to the unreleased review on Western anime themes. But until then, I've been Nick Starwind, you have been my audience, and I shall see you next time.